so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. It was 6.30am on the 11th of November 2020 when the Australian Federal Police knocked on the door of a fancy Dover Heights home. A 49-year-old woman opened that door wearing activewear. She wasn't expecting visitors. The day before, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission had frozen her bank accounts. And today, the police were here to raid her home. The woman would watch on for the entire day, along with her son and husband, as officers took couture gowns, designer bags and shoes and jewellery and documents. Twelve hours later, the police left with everything that had ever mattered to her. The next morning, the woman would disappear, sparking one of the most intriguing true crime investigations the country has ever seen. It's been seven days since Melissa Caddick left her Dover Heights home, presumably for an early morning run. She hasn't returned and she hasn't contacted any family members since. And uh, her family say that this disappearance is completely out of character. Police are treating the disappearance of an Eastern Sydney mother and businesswoman as suspicious. An air, sea and land search hasn't found any trace of Melissa Craddock, who vanished a week ago. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter, a podcast where people tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. My name is Mia Friedman. When a wealthy Sydney woman called Melissa Caddick was reported missing by her husband... Melissa is a dedicated and incredible mother, a beautiful daughter, sister and loved wife. We are asking the community to help bring Melissa home. That is all. At the time, it seemed like a fairly standard missing persons case. But as chief investigative reporter at the Sydney Morning Herald, Kate McClymont was the first one to reveal that there was so much more to this story. And when a human foot washed up on a south coast beach months later, a whole other line of investigation opened into what actually had happened to Melissa Caddick. Kate McClymont is the top investigative journalist in the country. She's the co-host of a podcast called Liar Liar that is all about the case of Melissa Caddick. And in her signature forensic style, Kate has uncovered a bunch of disturbing, astonishing information about the life and disappearance of a wealthy woman who wasn't at all what she seemed. Here's my chat with Kate McClymont. Kate, who was the first person that Melissa Caddick defrauded? Look, I think the first person was her oldest friend from school, a really lovely woman, Kate Horn. And the thing that is so upsetting about her is that she's a disability worker, she's a single mum, she's quietly spoken and a really kind person. And the thing that upsets her so much, she said, you know, if it was just me, I could live with that. But I introduced her to the rest of my family and they've lost a total of $10 million. And, you know, she said the heartache of seeing her mother, who was financially independent, now having to queue up at Centrelink to get money, she said it's just heartbreaking. This was Melissa's oldest friend. They'd been friends since preschool. Preschool, that's right. What stage of her life was she at? Well, it's interesting because if you go back even further than that, we'll come to the Ponzi scheme in a minute, But one of the things that Tom Steinford and I, my co-host, have found so interesting is that in one of her very first jobs after school, she's caught forging her boss's signature on checks to get money. So he confronts her, marches her out the door. But I think there's a a degree of commercial embarrassment and people Mm. don't want to take legal action or call the police. They think it's probably bad for business. So she just packed up her little designer handbag and out she went. So she was using the company checkbook to write herself checks that she would then cash. Well, no, she was paying the invoices, but she was inflating invoices and sort of picking the top off it. It was, you know. So it was quite complicated what she was doing. And then in one of her next jobs, it was as simple as getting a bottle of Correction fluid. Remember the old uh, liquid uh, paper? Liquid paper. That's it. So she was just whiting out 
the percentage commission mm. and giving herself double the amount. So you think, okay, there are two instances that she that, got away with. That she got away with. Another one that we found is that, um, you know, people are chipping in for a friend's present for a Thermomix. Everyone's chipped in $50. Melissa, where's yours? And then she sent a copy of, you know how you can send somebody, um, here's my transfer. Yeah. And they realised she had left a digit off the bank transfer and just said the problem's at your end. Like even paying $50 for a joint friend's Mm. birthday party. She has got a sociopathic personality Mm. to do that. So then she goes to England. She's married to her first husband who's a lawyer. She gets to England and I think she's lonely and bored. So she begins having an affair with her hairdresser from Sydney. They get caught. She comes back to Australia and she immediately tells everyone everything that she did she said her husband did. He cheated on me. He isolated me. He was abusive. He was controlling. He's fleeced me of all my money. And in fact, it was the complete opposite. So she gets back to Sydney and we're talking January 2012. How old's her child at this point? Her child at this stage is six. She comes back and she thinks, what am I going to do with my life now? And that's when she set upon her oldest friend, Kate. You talk about being sociopathic and it's interesting I noticed that you used present tense when you're talking about her, which we'll get to later I'm sure, but it's very different fleecing the person you work for, you know, an acrimonious relationship maybe, whatever. A friend, her friend Kate had no financial experience. Can you explain how she actually convinced her to give her money? What she did was Kate, you know that I've been working as a financial advisor. I'm making a very healthy income for myself investing in shares. And you know what? We're in the same boat now. Our marriages have broken down. We're both single mums. Why don't I help you? I'm doing it for myself. So it's absolutely no trouble whatsoever to do it for you oh, thank as well. You, Melissa, I know, but that's, that's yeah, exactly. I'm, all, I'm wanting to say thank you, Melissa. That'd be great. Can I just give you the money and you can just sort yes. it for me? Because yes. I don't know that stuff very exactly. well. Exactly. Exactly. So she hands over that, then she hands over more. How much and money how, did she give her? I think she gave her about 150000 to start off with transferred her super, wow. then cashed in her own shares. But this is how the scheme worked. It was, Melissa got your money and she pretended that she was investing in shares for you. So each month, you, Mia, would get your portfolio statement and it would say there was Comsec on the top and underneath there were only ever four shares. And wouldn't you know it, it's a miracle, those four shares that Melissa chose for you always did remarkably well. Were they real shares? No, no, they were real companies, except there was, um, along the way that she was operating this Ponzi scheme, there were so many sliding door moments when she was almost caught. And a couple of investors noticed that she'd invested in Pilbara Mining. And the company's real name is Pilbara Minerals. And they thought at the time, that's odd that you know, Australia's largest online share trading firm, Comsec Comsec is, is, would make such a mistake. But they just said, oh, well, I guess everyone makes a typo. And it's things like that. So there were these little signs. Yes. You talk about a Ponzi scheme a lot, and that's obviously what Melissa did. Can you explain what one is? Sure. A Ponzi scheme is you rob to Peter to pay Paul. So you give me your money, And I keep telling you, here's your fake returns. Each month I send you your results. Do you give me my... No, no, I just send you any returns. Forged paperwork. Well, why would you want your returns back when Melissa on paper is making so much money for you? So I invested $100,000 with you and then the next month she sends the statement, the forged statement from Consec saying that I have made now. You're now $111,000. So I'm like, great, keep going with my money. Keep going and I'll give you more. more." So that was the dreadful thing. And none of the money was in any of these shares. It was spent on 
the most extravagant holidays on designer clothes, shoes, bags. I mean, she was spending half a million dollars every year just on the family trips to Aspen, to Fiji, to New York. Four times a year, they would jet off overseas on family holidays. Meanwhile, Kate Horn, the person we were just talking about it, was scrimping best and friend, saving. Single mother. They were going on camping trips to Bundina, while Melissa is using her money for a month in Aspen, a, a week in Mexico. The place they were going to in Fiji was $6,500 per night, per night. And Kate was going on camping trips to Bandina because she had no cash, but she thought her superannuation and her investment was making all this money because Melissa was managing it. And all she cared about was saving enough money to give her own two daughters a start in life. She just wanted to be able to give them something, perhaps for a deposit on a house when they were adults. And so that was the first time. And then how long until she needed to feed again? It's like a shark. But it is like a shark. That's the thing about a Ponzi scheme is so the money's going in, but you're not making any money. The only way you're getting money is to get more victims. So you have to keep stealing and stealing and stealing because you're spending, spending, spending. And, of course, we know that $30 million went in to her bank accounts and $23 million is still missing. So along the way, there are people who want their money back or, you know, there's changes hmm. in their life. So $7 so million. So like I want to buy a house or I'm getting a divorce, I need exactly. some cash. Melissa, can you sell my shares? And she and- would try to talk you out of it. How would she do that? Well, one of the most extraordinary events in this whole dreadful saga is that one woman goes skiing to Aspen, and this is where Melissa went every single January school holidays for the whole month. You can imagine the cost. So they're staying in the same hallway at a place called North of Nell. They get chatting. They realise their parents at the same school. Melissa says, I own this apartment which was not true. In fact, she left her non-existent apartment in her will, but we'll come to that. Anyway, so they're staying there and Melissa seems to be doing very well. As Mm. I just said, she's staying there for a month. She's got... Sending her son to a fancy private school. Head to toe in designer ski wear. So she's got all the trappings of wealth. Mm. So one of the methods that fraudsters get people in is to make themselves look unavailable and exclusive. So if you say, um, gee, I'd love to be part of your scheme, a con artist will say to you, I'd love to have you, but I only ever have 15 clients at a time. This was what Melissa would do. I so only- Prue and Aspen yes. went and bumped into her in the corridor. They went, oh, yes, I've seen you at yep, school, yep, yep, whatever. Yep. They got talking. What do you do for a living? And then how did Melissa get Prue's money? What did she do to So say- she said- I'm so sorry, Prue. I don't have any spaces available at the moment. For clients. Because I only ever take 15 people. I'd love to help you. But isn't it funny? A few weeks after they get back to Sydney, a place becomes available. And she did this time and time again. And it makes people feel, well, she's obviously not a shark because she could have taken my money earlier, but Mm. she didn't. And it's classic FOMO, fear of missing out. It's like, I want what I can't have. One investor that I spoke to who's lost $450,000 of her superannuation and she's retired, she can't earn that again. And she said, that's what Melissa did to her, said, no, I'm terribly sorry, I can't take you on as a client. And when she later rang back, she said, I felt so grateful. I felt so blessed. I felt that everyone else had put in so much more money and that she was only taking my $450,000 because everyone else put in so much more. And you think, isn't that terrible that you would feel grateful to hand over your money to such a shark? And that's the psychological manipulation. Exactly. But the other thing is most of the people that she defrauded were family and friends. And there's something that's called an affinity fraud, 
where it makes it easier for fraudsters to steal the money because you've got that element of trust. We believe that one of the people that brought her undone was a doctor's wife in Perth who had nothing to do with Melissa, whereas all the other people, they might have checked Pilbara minerals, they might have done this, they might have done that, but because it was Melissa, they Who had no their brother reason. Was investigating yes. in their mother or their work colleague. Well, it's her cousin. That you know, her she, own cousin. Yeah, yeah, her brother, Melissa's yes. brother, and Melissa's Two cousin. Yes. So she's taking all this money, and occasionally Prue would want her money back, so she'd have to get more money from someone else to give Prue exactly. her money back. Exactly. So it's robbing Peter no to one pay Paul. Can get, so that's what a Ponzi scheme is. Because there is no money. What do you have to do to keep it going? I mean, obviously there's not getting caught by authorities, but you just have to keep the money coming in. And you have to be able to return money to people mm. when they demand it. Because if you don't, that's when the scheme collapses. So it's interesting when you compare Melissa Caddick to Bernie Madoff, who is probably the biggest Ponzi scheme operator in the world, and he was operating in America. The same thing as Melissa, but on a far, far grander scale. There's two ways that your scheme collapses. It's one, when all your people want their money back at once, or you run out of people to fleece. And in his case, the global financial crisis hit in 2008 and investors were panicking and asking for their money back and his whole house of cards collapsed. collapsed. Now, Melissa's might have kept going except that, as we were mentioning before, there was a whole group of doctors in Perth who invested and literally they're doing an operation, they're chatting about how fabulously well their stocks have done under this you know, woman, Melissa Caddick in Sydney. So they say to you know one of the doctors, you know, mate, you should invest with her. But look, you know, she doesn't like to take on new clients. So the guy thinks, okay, I'll give her a ring. She got back later and said, actually, I do have a space that's become available. But unfortunately for Melissa Caddick, his wife was an accountant, so she wanted to know about she her. She did some more due diligence. Yes, and some homework. her financial services license. So, this was the woman who discovered Melissa Caddick did not have a license, and the other person she rang was the woman whose license Melissa was using. Mm. So that happened in September and October in two thousand and nineteen. There was a tip-off, an anonymous tip-off made to ASIC in November 2019. They did nothing. So another complaint is made in June 2020. And they're the financial service regulators. Yes. Yeah. Their explanation, I do have some sympathy for them, is that they get tens of thousands of complaints mm. a year. And what had come in about Melissa Caddick was she was an unlicensed financial operator, not that she was a major, major fraudster. Yeah. So that's the sort of the fraud side of her life, the criminal side of her life, which is has been going through this time. What's the rest of her life look like? Because firstly, I can't imagine what that stress is. Like, was she a normal person with a normal life? She was a mother. She had a husband. Look, yes and no. And it's funny, my daughter gave me a facial for Christmas and – you know, I'm just having the facial and the woman saying, oh, you know, God, I had a dreadful thing happen to one of my clients. It was Melissa Caddy. And I sort of no. said, no. Oh, yes, exactly. I said, no. And she said the funny thing was when she came in, one, she always paid in cash, but two, she was always stressed, always. And she said, I just presume she had this big financial job. And it's interesting that the psychiatrists we've spoken to as well said that running this kind of Ponzi scheme is really stressful. You're always uh, exactly you're cutting, you're pasting, you're forging, you're stealing. You're <laughs> but convincing it's, people, people, you're looking for your next mark. Exactly, exactly. And it's also interesting as to, you know, this weird spending. And it seems to be that Melissa probably had what's now called a compulsive buying disorder. It's known as CBD. And it's where you have low self-esteem, depression, underconfidence. And the act of going into a shop 
and buying high quality goods. And you know what it's like when you're duchessed and fawned over like by sales woman. assistants. Yeah. Yes. Like it's your money that they're yeah. interested in. And, you know, the fact that you get onto a plane and you turn left and you sit in, you know, business or first. And you, exactly. So all those things made her feel good. But it doesn't last long and you have to keep doing it. It's interesting that one thing they said is that um, you often buy the same thing over and over again. For instance, she had six, I never quite know how to pronounce it, um, Avi Legere, how do you say Hervé it? Legere. Hervé Legere dresses. Those bandage dresses that yes. were very popular in the early 2000s. She had six. And they cost like thousands of dollars each. Yes. She had six. Yes. And they're not really the kind of thing that as a, you wouldn't really wear them as a sort of suburban mum. But this is the other thing when you're talking about her life. So as we were saying, she divorced her first husband. That all ended acrimoniously. And she just lied about him, destroyed his standing and reputation in their friendship circle. Now, he was from England. So they were her friends, her friendship. Did she have custody of their son? So she came back to Australia, changed her phone number, stopped him having contact with the child. And he fought and fought and, you know, they did share custody. But I sort of feel this poor child Mm. being, you know, torn between these parents. So, Have you found any information about what her relationship was like with her son, like as a mother? Oh, look, she absolutely doted on her son. I must say in the podcast, we've tried so Mm. hard to keep him out of it. Yeah. Because I think he's just got enough going on in his life. Imagine being a teenager. Mm. You share the same name as now one of the country's most notorious fraudsters. So did she have friends? Did she have girlfriends? Well, was she close to her family? I mean, she ripped off her family, which is a whole she, other thing. Look, she was close to her family, but it, it's interesting talking to some of her relatives who say, you know, you would go to Melissa's for a family party or something like that, and there would be Melissa's trainer, Melissa's chef, Stefano Canturi, the person she bought all the jewels from. It was as though she surrounded herself with, um, I don't well, know, would you call it, you, would, Like people who you're paying to be your friends, essentially. Even except, the fact yes. that she married the guy or had the affair and then married the guy who did her hair, it's like exactly none of those relationships are real, are they, in many ways? No, and also people like Kate Horn, she still lives down the Shire Way, and she said that um, none of us were ever impressed by Melissa's fancy clothes or goods or houses, they weren't the things that mattered to us in our lives. And it doesn't look like she ever made any great friends with the other mothers at Mm. school. And interestingly, she didn't try to defraud any of the school parents. But what about Prue, who she met in Aspen? That was a chance meeting in a corridor. And the fact, it wasn't done in the school environment. Mm. So... I think that you have those conflicting things. But the Mm. most interesting relationship is her one with Anthony Coletti, her second husband. As we mentioned, she met him at Joe Bailey's hair salon at Westfield Bondi Junction. It's a very fancy hair salon. (laughs) Yes. Lest people think it's kind of like in a shopping mall. It's like a very fancy high-end salon. Yes, and Joe Bailey, the main Society salon is, yes, in Double Bay. Mm. This is sort of like the satellite version mm. of the main hair salon. But I've spoken to some people who had Anthony Coletti as their hairdresser and said he just never shut up about, you know, he and his wife were going on these trips and they just thought, you're a hairdresser. Don't mean to be rude, but mm. how are you affording these amazing Mm. trips. It's also interesting because he was 11 years her junior and a lot of people mistook him for her son. Ouch. Ouch. (laughs) So she was how old when she disappeared? She was 49. They'd been together for quite some time, hadn't they? Yes, they married on New Year's Eve 2013. So they had this, you know, spectacular 
wedding with the three changes of outfits and champagne flowing all night, all of it stolen money, all of it. So they marry on New Year's Eve, on New Year's Day, they're off to Aspen for their month-long holiday, all of it stolen funds. And those people who were at the wedding, they're all her victims. Usually you would think as a criminal you would want to get far away from the victims of your crimes, but her crimes almost relied or her Ponzi scheme relied on staying close to them and keeping them reassured so that they'd kept their money with her. And the other interesting thing was that the lie she told to people about where she'd got the money from, because financial advisors can make a good living, but nothing like the life that she was living. Mm. You know, you've got the Dover Heights mansion, you've got, you know, her husband driving a $390,000 sports car, she's got the Merc. She wears a $14,000 Oscar de la Renta ball gown to a school, you know, charity function. So Does that, that mind- didn't raise questions? No. So what she did, so to each person she told a variation of how she was so rich. So to one person she said, oh, look, when I was working as a financial advisor, I devised this superannuation platform that I sold to the big institutions. I made $86 million. To another person, she said, when I left that company, I had a sexual harassment suit against them and I got a major payout. To another person, she said, I've made a fortune in Bitcoin because she needed to explain to each person why it was that she was so wealthy because it did not make sense. I'm Kate McClymont and you're listening to No Filter with Mia Friedman. So the day of the raid, how did that unfold? Very badly as it turned out. Did she know? Look, there's questions about whether she did or didn't know. Her employees say that she'd bought a shredding machine, she'd taken herself off Facebook and Instagram. Did she suspect something was going on? I don't know. According to the investigators from the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, or otherwise known as ASIC, they said she was genuinely shocked when they turned up. So what happens is 6.30 a.m., there's a knock at the door, there's, you know, eight federal police, another 10 ASIC investigators, they've got a search warrant. You can imagine the shock of all these people in your house going through everything. And not only that, the warrant allowed for the seizure of the proceeds of crime. So she sat as her... Wedding dress was taken away, her Oscar de la Renta ball gown, all her shoes, her handbags, her jewellery, all paraded out one after the other. The last of the people from ASIC left at about 6.30 that night. So they've been there about 12 hours. And what did she do? Like from your sources, what was her behaviour while they were there? Shocked, helpful. She was polite you know, she didn't scream or yell or anything like that. She, she wasn't was belligerent. She no, didn't argue. No, no, she did, she did didn't. she try to make excuses? No. Or they don't tell you what they're looking for, they just take the they stuff? They just take the stuff. And she was told that she had to be in court on Friday morning at 9.45 a.m. and that she would have to produce all her assets and liabilities. Going inside her head from that knock on the door, she knew it was over. She knew it was, it all was over. over. It was over. She absolutely knew. But what is interesting is what happened next and what her husband didn't do. So the last people leave at 6.30. Now, according to ASIC, they've been able to monitor the activity on she was allowed to keep a phone and a computer. That night, she was Googling about what they were going to order on Uber Eats for dinner. Presumably they bugged everything. They didn't. Why not? Because uh, no, at that, I would have. <laughs> no, but at this stage, all they think is that it's a financial fraud. They don't think about her disappearing. They don't think oh, of okay. any. It's just they've got the money trail and seizing all these things, they think they have enough. And the other thing she was looking at is looking up lawyers' names. So they were the things that she did. 
About 10 days after she went missing, Anthony Coletti and her brother addressed the police. You know how much we love you. Um, you just come home. Everything's taken care of. You're not in trouble. Melissa, please let us know that you're safe and sound. We love you. And Anthony Coletti tells the media pack, so what happened that night? And he said, oh, she went to bed. It was just like normal. And you think, it is not just like normal. She has just had the worst day of her life. Yeah. Nothing is normal. And in her head, she knows every relationship in my life is about to be destroyed. Destroyed. Exactly. So at 5.30 the next morning, her son later says to police, look, I was upstairs in the gym on the third floor. I heard the front door open and close. That's all anyone knows. It's just the sound of a door opening and closing. And The problem for the police when they finally did find out that she was missing was that during the ASIC raid, the CCTV equipment had been confiscated. So if that had been working, they could have seen what time she left. Did she get into a car? Did she meet somebody? Did she run out the door? What time did she leave? None of that was available. And also the police canvassed all the streets in the area, nothing. Not one person's CCTV footage has picked her up nowhere. That's unusual. That is unusual. Look, everything about this case is unusual. Because the other day the police knocked at our door and there'd been a break and enter in a car and they were going and seeing if everyone had CCTV footage and we did and we handed it over to the police. I mean, it's fairly hard these days to avoid being seen anywhere. Exactly. But anyway, so that is on the Thursday morning. Now, it's not until noon on Friday that her husband reports her missing. It's 30 hours have gone by. He doesn't ring her parents. He doesn't ring her brother. He doesn't ring any of her friends. Why? Hello? Have you seen have Melissa? You, have you seen Melissa? So you can only imagine, and again, I don't want to talk about the son too much, but that night she's not home. Everything that's happened the day before has happened Anthony and Melissa's son sit down for dinner or like what? What? Exactly. Yeah. What are you saying? Oh, mum's. Yeah. And and don't forget, she didn't take her phone, her car keys or her wallet. They are all left on the kitchen bed. And if she went for a run, because she often went for a run most mornings, that's what they, she even though no one saw took her. her phone. She, I was going to say, so she always took her phone when she went running. Yep. One of her relatives, they said, look, Don't read anything too sinister into his not calling the police because we think it was such a controlling relationship that he didn't know what to do, so he did nothing. Uh, In case she was mad. Yes. You know, in case she got angry at him for doing the wrong thing. Yes, so he did nothing. Okay, well, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt because we assume that he didn't know about all of this, or do we not assume? No, look, even his own father, Rodo Coletti, who's an accountant, said rather rudely, Anthony's just a hairdresser. He doesn't know anything about finances. Mm. He wouldn't know the first thing about Melissa's fraud. And I don't think there's any evidence that he knew about it, Mm. was involved in it Mm. at all. So she goes missing. All the people who have invested with her, how do they find out? They don't find out that their money's gone. Yes, until they read my story in the Sydney Morning Herald. None of them know. And so there's a woman missing in Dover Heights. Even her family. Melissa Caddick, he gives a press conference. That was the first time I saw. They don't think, oh, hang on, she's the one with our money. Did they not know she was missing? No, because her extended family did not know for a week that she was missing. And when they were told, it was that there was a disgruntled investor from Perth who may have, you know, wanted her done in. Because that's what... the raid on her house, was that not publicised? No. Okay. And I only knew about it because ASIC had executed a search warrant on another house in the eastern suburbs. And when I rang up to find out about that, the federal police said, uh, now, hold on. Do you mean the one in Wallaroy Road in Wallara or Wallangra Road in Dover Heights? And I said, oh, look, I'm interested in the first one, but 
what's happening at the second one? And they said, oh, I don't know, some woman, a Melissa Caddick. So I started looking and then the next thing I know, she's disappeared. So as to how people found out, I find out that the ComSec accounts, a normal client account, you have eight digits. And Melissa had only six. So I write this in my story and when it appears on the Saturday morning, the first call I get is from a victim saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, I've only got six digits. And then I get more and more. And then, you know, people are ringing me up crying. And then it's not until ComSec opens on Monday, people ring up to be told there has never been an account in that name. So those How many poor people? people, around 60. And the reason why it's a little bit flexible is that some people were done twice. They had a superannuation and she was investing money in shares. So some people had two accounts. Among those 60 were her parents. They never invested in her fraud. They got caught a different way. So they're in their 80s and it's time for them to sell up from the big family home. So Melissa convinces them to buy an apartment in Edgecliffe. Of course, it's so much more convenient to her because it's a half hour drive to Connell's Point where they were living. So she persuades them, you sell your house, you give the money from your house sale, you give it to me and I'll pay down the mortgage of the apartment I have bought for you. So they hand over their one point million dollars and what does she do with it? She uses quite a chunk of it to buy a $590,000 diamond ring She uses more of it for private jets in Aspen and the rest goes on lifestyle expenses. So none of their money goes to pay down the mortgage. So now this has caused a huge rift in Melissa's family because her parents have taken legal action saying we should get our money back. And her other victims who are their relatives, cousins, friends are saying, hang on, We gave her money thinking that we were getting shares. You gave her money thinking it was going to the mortgage. We are both ripped off. Mm. Anyway, so there's some anxiety as that plays through the court at the moment with Barb and Ted Grimley. You can't blame them. They're in their 80s. Where are they going to How do you even process that, though? Have they spoken out about their feelings about this? Either when she no. was missing or Look, they have, with the court case? They have in text messages to family and friends and they've got the double whammy of grieving for their daughter, discovering that she's a fraudster and failing to understand how she could possibly leave her son. I think that's what they find the hardest to grasp is the abandonment of her son. When she first went missing... I remember because it's only a few suburbs away from where I live. It presented as something we've seen many times before, where a supposedly grieving parent or spouse says, my child is missing or my partner's missing, and it turns out that they're the one that did it. When did that change to thinking, oh, she's disappeared herself? Look, I think that because behind the scenes they knew that ASIC had executed the search warrant and that she was at the centre of a major fraud. I just think in the back of their minds, the police probably thought that she'd disappeared or she had self-harmed. And I think it's interesting that the reason why I don't think any of her investors were involved in her disappearance is that they didn't know they were victims when she first went missing, they're grieving for their friend. You know, poor Melissa, she's got caught up in some investment that's gone horribly wrong. They don't know. So you can imagine the double whammy of one, finding out that, you know, your friend or your family member, lovely Melissa, is not only missing, perhaps presumed dead, but she's a fraudster Mm. and stolen your money. The suburb in which she lives is close to a notorious suicide spot. When did that become an area of focus? Look, I think because she lived only 150 metres 
from the cliff line. And Dover Heights is about four kilometres from the gap, but it's the same high cliffs, the same coastal line. And the psychiatrists that we have spoken to for the podcast have said, look, when you're in that kind of frame of mind, accessibility is what's going through your mind. If there's something close by, that's what's, you know, going through your mind. And she had just had the worst day Mm. of her life. She knew it was over. So which brings us then to the fact that, you know, some months later, her foot, her partial remains are found washed up on a remote beach on the south coast, you know, 400 kilometres from Sydney. A running shoe belonging to missing Sydney businesswoman Melissa Caddick found washed up on the sand at Bonda National Park. A group of friends camping at Hobart Beach making the grim discovery. I can remember Tom Steinford and I were at the police headquarters that day. You know, our phones were absolutely buzzing. There was going to be a big announcement. Had she handed herself in? Had she been murdered? Had someone come forward? Like no one knew exactly what it was. What did you think? And months after, as the days turned to weeks, turned to months, and you're on this case and learning more and more about the fraud, did you very quickly deduce? No, I thought she was missing. Mm -hmm. And I only thought that because her family, her friends, the women who worked for her, universally they said she wouldn't do that. She would have had a plan B. Like not one single person, even now, they still think that Melissa is out there somewhere. So that day, Tom Steinfeld and I thought, right, okay, that's the end of the mystery. Melissa Caddick is dead. That is her foot. And I was talking to the writers of Underbelly, who did the Melissa Caddick story for, you know, Channel 9. They said to me, no, no, no. The day her foot washed up, that's when we knew we had a drama. And I thought, oh, my goodness, the difference in... So you thought it was the end of the story yes. and they thought it was the beginning. And they were right and I was wrong. I never thought that that foot washing up would raise even more questions. Where was the rest of her? How did her foot get there? Why was it so far from Sydney? And they're the questions that people still, almost every day, someone sends me an email or stops me in the street and says, but... Have you thought of this and what about this and what if she sawed off a bit? What if it's not really her foot? <laughs> it's oh. Kate, it's, you know, it's interesting what you say and I know we've this whole true crime genre. At the heart of this, though, is a human woman who did some terrible things but she didn't kill anyone and she has a son And the way we're all talking about it, and I won't say I'm, you know, I was glued to media reports and and I remember everyone then descended on the South Coast and then there were all these reports over the next few days and they found a bit more of this and they found a bit more of that and all these different body parts that turned out belonged to other people. And it became this macabre treasure hunt is an awful way of putting it. And then the newspapers were like, everyone wanted to see what does the foot look like in the shoe? And then some blurred the image and some didn't. This idea of dehumanising her and the fact that there's so little regard for her as a person, how do we process that? Look, I think that there's so little regard for her as a person because she didn't murder people but she financially murdered them. She stripped away their life, their prospects. You know, I was just speaking to one of the victims the other day and she said, my mother just wants to die. (sighs) Like, uh, and I think that, you know, seeing what it does to people's Mm. lives. So she might not have physically killed them, but she did it in so many other ways. And I felt really sorry for the victims because at the beginning, people just classified them as greedy schmucks who, you know, had too much money in the first place. Yes, and were just didn't greedy. Keep track of it. And greedy. And that is so not the case. And I think for them it's been, you know, a really hard journey because not half the population, but people do think either you're an idiot or you're greedy. And neither of those things mm. are the case. What are the two different explanations for her foot being on that beach? 
I mean, I'm sure there's many more, but the two main ones are that she took her life near the cliffs, near her house. And how did the foot become detached from her body? There's a very interesting case in Canada, and it's a case of the 21 disembodied feet. So 21 feet washed up on the coast of Canada between Seattle and Vancouver over a period of 13 years. An inquest was held and they discovered that it was the fact that the feet all had running shoes. So since 2007, the air pocket and the nylon in running shoes, one provides buoyancy and two provides protection. So when bodies go into the water, especially if they have been injured in a fall or anything like that, this is rather gory, but um, marine predators will skeletonize a body within about three days. But that area along those cliffs, there's the East Australian Current, which is one of the strongest ocean currents in the entire world. Is that on Finding Nemo? Exactly. I know exactly. that current. It's ex- <laughs> you do. From Finding Nemo. Nemo. The turtles. S- yes. Yeah. So, you know, we've spoken to scientists and oceanographers who've pointed out it is quite possible for a body to have become perhaps, you know, eaten or at least disintegrated. And because the shoes provide flotation and protection, that's what is surviving. Now, why it washed up on that beach, which just happened to be a beach where Melissa had gone camping with her school as a child, like of all the crazy Mm. coincidences, but it is possible. Mm. However, we don't know and we won't know until there's a coronial inquest in September. We don't know whether there are enough human remains to determine how that foot did become detached from the body. People still think it could have been sawn off. I personally don't think Melissa could have chopped her own foot off. Well, let's just talk about that. (laughs) The people who think she chopped her foot off, dropped it in the ocean, and then did what? And also how? Like, what do they say? Like, the people who think that's what happened, what's the rest of their story? That she did what? Well, it doesn't actually get that far. It's just that she's in one leg, hopping round the Greek island, South America, you name it, that's where she is. The realities are... And that she chopped off her, her own, own foot because you, otherwise, it, you know, a surgeon or... During it, we were in a pandemic. So it was hard even to get to go to see doctors, let alone to get one and say, could you help me chop my foot off? Mm. Then you've got to go somewhere to get a prosthetic. Who's going to nurse you? while you're recovering from your amputation. And if you chopped your own foot off, you'd just die of blood loss immediately and also it would be so painful. How could you do it? Correct. Why do you think that idea is so appealing to people? Because it's a mystery. And it wasn't helped by the fact that the Daily Telegraph managed to get the head of the New South Wales Marine Command, who was in fact in charge of the search, to say, I'm telling you, That foot did not have enough algae on it. It wasn't decomposed enough. How could it have got from Dover Heights to Mm. near Tarthra, hundreds of kilometres away, away, I'm not buying it. And so when you get someone in, you know, a a position of authority to say those things, then that again raises Mm. well, well and he would know. So... You had, you know, that speculation as well, you know, adding to all this. Knowing as zero as I do about forensics, I would have thought that a foot that had been naturally decomposed and come away from a body in the ocean would look very different to a foot that had been... But it depends. We don't know how much of the remains there were Mm. and whether the forensic pathologists had enough to determine... But why didn't they just say... Because they've had the foot for a long time now. (laughs) So why didn't they say, Kate? I don't know. Are they waiting for the inquest? Look, I'm I'm sure that they are, but you would think that they, it might have helped everyone if they'd put out a preliminary finding Hmm. saying. Is it unusual to not? No, not really. But the other interesting thing is um, it's been cremated. The family had a foot cremation in 
April of last year. So Mm. I think after all the forensic pathologists had examined it, it was released back to To the the family. family. Was everyone there at that memorial? No, there was just a handful of close family members attended that. All of whom she'd probably ripped off. Some of whom she had. Where do you think she is? I think she took her own life. On that day? Yes. And that's the other thing that we should remember is that if her husband had gone that morning straight away to the police and said, I'm so worried about my wife, this is what happened yesterday and she's not here, they could have commenced the search so much earlier. And if Melissa Caddick had taken her life and was in the water, they might have been able to retrieve Mm. her body if that's what indeed Mm. happened. But that 30 hours delay just set back everyone. If she hadn't had disappeared, if she'd have been brought to justice, what would have happened to her? How long would she have spent behind bars? Look, she probably would have spent between, I'd say, five and nine years in jail. So she still would have been out in her mid-50s, you know, parole, good behaviour, etc. She still would have been able to have a life. Yes. I mean, no doubt that a lot of people would have been very angry at her and she would have no money left or no assets. But she'd be alive. But she would be alive and she could have had a final chapter to spend with her family or make a new start. She could have. Well, that's what I think happened. She always knew it was going to come to an end. But that's the Because it has to with these things. Exactly. But you sort of say to yourself, how could she have done this? And then you think, well, but she did. So how could she have kept doing it? Mm. And, you know, one of the interesting things is that just after she got dobbed in to ASIC, this is in late 2019, she actually approached what we call a lender of last resort, and they're like legal loan sharks. She paid them $25,000 to get approval for a loan of five million dollars. So she was going to borrow five million dollars. And in the end, I think new victims came in so she didn't need it. But you think she was never going to pay that back. Mm. Because you kind of think, well, was her plan always, right, well, I'm going to end it if I get caught? Exactly. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. And that's why all her victims say one of the best things about Melissa was she was so organised. She was organised. She was efficient. She'd get your paperwork to you. She would demand that, you know, you give her everything that you need. And because everything ran like clockwork, they just don't believe for one second that she didn't have a plan B. Mm. And I never met her and I can't judge. As an outsider, I just think, that day was so overwhelming that that was it for her. But the people who know her much better than I do think completely the opposite. The Melissa Caddick case is just one of many dozens and dozens that Kate has worked on in her award-winning career. And in the course of her investigations, she has been threatened, harassed, intimidated, she's had death threats, and she has been sued by powerful people. And they all wanted her to be quiet and stop reporting. But she never has. We kept the mics running for a special bonus episode of No Filter with Kate, and you can hear it right now if you click the link in the show notes, if you're a Mamma Mia subscriber. And if you're not, you can become one. Why not support women's media? We make bonus episodes like this most weeks, and you will get unlimited access to them every time as a paid subscriber. You can listen to Kate's podcast, Liar Liar, wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer is Gia Moylan. The executive producer is Eliza Ratliff and I'm Mia Friedman. 